Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India It is our concluding lecture today and in a sense it will be a kind of a resume of all that we have done in this program so far. In a sense we shall look back at what we have done in terms of understanding the definition of the universals in the name of economics since the time of Greeks and right up to modernity into evolutionary economics. We have noticed that each time we talked about a particular kind of economics, whether it is Aristotle, whether it is scholastics, whether it is, whether it is mercantilists, whether it is physiocrats, whether it is Smith and so on and so forth, right up to the time well past neoclassical economics through Keynes into institutional and evolutionary economics. Each of these occasions, economics seemed to acquire a different meaning in terms of the universals it was addressing. Each of the times, the subject seems to have a different scope, the subject seems to have a different coverage and more importantly, the meanings of economic processes acquire different interpretations in each of these points of view. This is in a sense what we are going to study today, to try and understand the process through which at different points in time, knowledge acquires different meanings and how such meanings are constructed in society. And we shall look at the construction of knowledge in economics as a part and parcel of this process. There are three things which are very important in order to understand this. One, there is always a historical context for construction of knowledge. In other words, knowledge always gets constructed at particular points of time in particular places. There is no such thing as knowledge which is constructed in abstraction as if it drops out of the sky. I am saying this because there are two very distinct views in human history about knowledge, post enlightenment and pre enlightenment. We know that enlightenment happened around 16th, 17th, 18th century, particularly 17th and 18th century. We know that there was a fundamental transformation of the way people looked at knowledge from the time of enlightenment onwards. From the time of, from the time of enlightenment, it seemed very clear that knowledge was something which was created by human beings and could be constructed and could be understood by the power of reason. Whereas, prior to enlightenment, knowledge was virtually the monopoly of the theologians of the church. In the rest of the world, when we are talking about say knowledge in a similar context, Enlightenment does not have a specific historical significance, but in many of the erstwhile colonial countries, which became independent in the 1950s and 60s, something like enlightenment occurred with the advent of modernity. A lot of things that happened in Europe during enlightenment happened in these countries with tremendous speed after their independence with the advent of modernity. So, we can look upon these countries too as pre independent and post independent. Again, the divide is clear. So, as I said, the way society constructed knowledge and understood what knowledge was differed pre enlightenment vis a vis post enlightenment. And within pre and post enlightenment, we find through our own study of economics. Again, there are different points of time 
where historical context has different meanings in the construction and creation of knowledge. For example, when we are talking about the time of the Greeks, we know that universals were looked upon from two points of view. And this is a duality in the construction of knowledge by society, which persists right up to the end of the scholastics, right up to 14th, 15th century. What is the duality? From one point of view, knowledge of universals was an object of faith. For example, long before Aristotle, there was the idea of Promethean cults, where Dionysius was said to have been born to the god Zeus. He was torn apart by some creatures who were half human and consumed and the myth of Dionysius assumed that he was reborn partly as divine, partly as mortal and the whole followers of the worship and followers and worshippers in the cult of Dionysius sincerely believed that partaking flesh of animals sacrificed in a sacrificial ritual was partaking the flesh of Dionysius and therefore acquiring or reaffirming their own divinity. Now mind you, it is from here as we saw that the Christian myth carries over of the blood and flesh of Christ, partaking in I think it is called communion, a little biscuit and a little sip of wine kneeling before the priest. He ritually offers you the flesh and blood of Christ. Now, this, this myth goes back as I said to some 3, 400 years before Christ to the myth of Dionysius in, the, in, the, in this myth. Now, the reason I am talking about this is that about this time in the life of Greeks, the universals of the world were defined partly in terms of faith and the, at the same time the Greek mind was inquiring. They were looking at the question, what is the universe composed of? Is it composed of air? Is it composed of earth? It is composed of light? Is it composed of heat? They were asking these questions too. So, they were asking very physical speculative questions about the universal. At the same time they were parallelly running articles of faith about what the universals were all about. We saw that there were two different compulsions for these universals, not just at the time of Greeks, but at the time of all humanity. Existence of uncertainty in existence looks upon people to look, pushes people to look upon or look for some unchanging eternals, which are not subject to uncertainty. And as we remember, this act of sheer brilliance happens in all civilizations at some point, where the tremendous uncertainty which you are faced with as a civilization, as a society, as a culture is at some point converted into perfect certainty. You say everything is the act of God and God is immutable, eternal, permanent, always indestructible, which means it is eternity, perfect certainty. So, you attribute to the will of a perfectly certain principle all the uncertainties. So, in this brilliant conversion, psychological conversion of uncertainty, eternally facing uncertainty into perfect certainty lies the birth of all faiths sociologically. There are various other dimensions to faith too, but from a social psychological point of view, we have seen that this is a crucial point at of departure in the emergence of civilizations. Whatever in the Greeks you find the existence of these two parallelly, universals occurring through faith and universals constantly coming up through the spirit of inquiry and speculation. 
Eventually, the spirit of inquiry and speculation acquires its own peak at the time of Pythagoras and his followers, where mathematics acquires a very unique significance, where astronomy and the study of physical phenomena acquires very, very special significance as a very permanent, as a very well directed line of inquiry. But subsequently, with the coming into existence of Plato and then Aristotle, once again, this speculative inquiring line of thought in a measure gets subsumed under faith once again. Whatever we find the parallel existence of these two, and that is the uniqueness of the historical epoch of the Greeks. After Greeks, you find certainly by the 5th century AD, by the time of people like Saint Jerome in church, well Saint Jerome and the great four saints of that time, you can include all four of them in this. By that time, all knowledge is taken as a proprietary property of church. Church has the sole monopoly over construction of knowledge on behalf of the society. Therefore, any attempt by any member outside of the church, any secular attempt to, of, for construction of knowledge is by very definition heresy and therefore, not condonable. Now, this approach continues right up to the time of 13, 14, 15th century right up to St. Thomas Aquinas, who tries to restore some credibility to the secular aspects of knowledge by acknowledging that there are not, there is knowledge which is only revealed, but there is also knowledge which is perceived and studied through the senses. So, St. Thomas makes this distinction and gives credibility to the secular sources of knowledge that is scholasticism. So, we find that economic ideas from the time of Aristotle right up to scholastics, there is a constant in the sense that the basic preoccupation of knowledge is theology and right up to St. Thomas Aquinas that is the way it is. And so, you have very many moral judgmental aspects about economics, which are part of theology. For instance, looking down upon usury, money lending from the time of Aristotle right up to St. Thomas Aquinas, usury is not tolerated. Money lending is considered fundamentally exploitative as compared to working on a farm or manufacturing something. This is a kind of a moral basis of looking at economic activities, which is part of the era of faith. However, you find by the time of the 16th century, A dramatic change happening in society. A, the church is no longer in control, sole monopoly of knowledge. Universities and such other bodies of knowledge are, are growing very fast. Second, the interest groups in society suddenly transform. No longer is the society dominated by landowners and the king or monarch it is not a rural aristocracy dominated society. The urban based merchant class, trading class acquires tremendous significance as a result of the great commercial revolution that has taken place by then. So, the dominant interest in society now is that of the trading and the merchant class and the interests of monarchs being essentially political, because they are the political heads of society. The interest of the merchant class, the mercantile class is now supported by the kings too. Then comes a whole school of thought or rather schools of thought, which get designated in the mercantilism, where the interest of these society is the same as the interest of the state and the interest of the state is identified with the interest of a single class of people, merchants. 
So, here is another epoch, where things have changed, particularly economics get liberated, gets liberated for the first time from its theological boundaries. Suddenly, economics get, gets looked at as if it is the state that mattered. And if the state was what mattered, it is the power of the economy that mattered. And when power of economy is what matters, then it is the strength of the mercantile class that matters. In short, you have the first organized school of economic thought coming then on its own, on its own steam as it were the mercantilist ideas. By the time you reach 18th century, society has gone through further transformation. The nation state has come into existence. The mercantile class has grown in strength and is now diversifying itself into an industrial class. In England and Scotland and in the rest of Europe slightly later, there is a great growth in the countryside in the name of agrarian revolution. New seeds are invented, new techniques are invented, new methods of crop rotation are invented. In short, there is a big revolution going on in agriculture over the 18th century. So, all this creates a new environment of who is prosperous, whose interests are involved in the economy. More importantly, the idea of prosperity acquires an importance by itself, more than the interest of the merchants, more than the interest of anybody, but a prosperous nation becomes a single important desideratum. So, in this historical epoch, you find first the rise of the physiocrats who identify prosperity with the prosperity of agriculture and with the prosperity of the landed class who depend on agriculture. And subsequently, or even during the time of physiocrats, the first significant economic principle comes into, un, comes into play, namely in order that society and its different classes are, are able to subsist, somebody who is productive has to generate a surplus. For instance, for landlords to subsist, there has to be a surplus from somewhere which enables them to subsist. And in fact, the physiocrats thought even all traders and merchants and artisans were also sterile, they did not, they were not productive. So, even for them to subsist, the surplus had to come from somewhere and in the physiocrats reckoning, the surplus came from land. So, they were very concerned about the circulation of product from agriculture to the rest of the economy and back. <coughs> so, early rudiments of economic theory come into existence during the time of physiocrats. Again, significance of the historical period. We do not have to emphasize this further. When we go past towards the end of 18th century and through into the 19th century, when the subject of economics blooms and blooms and blooms through the writings of, through the writings of first Smith, then Say and Ricardo and Malthus and Mill and so forth, Javons, Menger, Walras, 19th century is a period of boom of economic theory. And the boom of economic theory not coincidentally occurs with the boom of capitalist industrialism. And the apogee of this boom in economic theory is the advent of neoclassical economics. And it is also the apogee of the supreme faith in individualism and in the faith in the in invisible hand, which working through individual choices is able to allocate resources most efficiently. So, the invisible hand which originates in Smith in 1776 reaches, reaches its culmination in Marshall in the early part of 20th century, where partial equilibrium analysis exemplifies the merits of free competitive laissez faire economy. And then of course, comes the crisis of capitalism, not in the way in which Marx was talking about it, but in the way in which 
Europe experienced it in the 1920s and 30s and it was discovered once again through another in another historical epoch that was the epoch of Keynes that laissez faire isn't all that great it doesn't seem to deliver the goods and the kind of situation which says law is talking about is notional it doesn't have to exist in reality and to create a convergence between the efficiency of a system in says law and the normal efficiency of an economy which is not reaching full employment the state comes in very importantly as not just a nurse maid, but an important intervener in the system. So, this is another historical epoch. This you can say is the peak of liberal European states. We will stop about historical epochs at this point and go into the next thing which is of importance namely the importance of the ideological context. We have already seen the importance of ideological context partly when we are looking at his historical epochs, because the way we discussed historical epochs is also the way we discussed ideologies. What is crucial is to understand that economic ideas do not float independently in society. They are part of the way ideas are created and they float around in society. Once again, if you look at Aristotle, Aristotle's ideas of economics were only pertaining to the household. Aristotle thought economics was a matter for the household to be concerned with, not for statesmen and kings. In other words, he was not thinking of macroeconomics. He was not even thinking of microeconomics because he thought trading is very bad. The thought trading is an unethical activity. Any profits made out of exchange as opposed to profits made out of manufacturing was immoral. And so, the ideological universe was very significant in the way people looked at economic processes. So, in Aristotle's times, morality, social morality was something under which all understanding of economics was subsumed. And as we saw, this persists, persists right up to the time of scholastics and culminates in St. Thomas Aquinas. In other words, we are thinking in terms of a movement from something like 300 BC to something like 14th century. We are talking of 1700 years of domination of the morality of society over how people made money and how people used it. This is how powerful the world of ideology was. Then once again, when you talk of mercantilism, that is a very big ideology. In other words, the interest of the economy was the interest of the state and the interest of the state was no different from the interest of the mercantile class. Here again, a new ideology is born, which is secular, which is not moralizing in terms of theology and religion, but which identifies the well-being of society with the well-being of one class. This is the beginning of the economics of capitalism, which all modern economics is. In short, it is not just the mercantilists who identified the well-being of the economy with the well-being of the mercantile class, but all other schools of thought subsequently barring physiocrats, either positively or negatively identified economics with the well-being of the capitalists. I am saying positively or negatively because through Smith and uh, Ricardo and Malthus and Mill and Walras and Jevons and Menger and Marshall and so on and so forth. All of them did not think once that you could have the welfare or the well-being of the economy outside of the welfare or well-being of the capitalist class. Negatively because a whole lot of protesting economics of the 19th century beginning with Saint Simo and so forth going right through up to Marx said yes modern economy is all obsessed with the capitalists, but they said it with bitterness, with cynicism and with dislike. They said how, how they wish society would be something different. With Marx it became a very idea of history. 
So, the ideology of Marxism was also an ideology of construction of knowledge in a very unique way. And this idea of history of Marx gave him to believe that the fall of capitalism was inevitable, which was reflected in his economic analysis of capitalism. And eventually, in the establishment of a socialist regime, which he hoped would come into existence. So, here again ideology comes in very significant. The whole of 19th century, the ideology of socialism, the ideology of critique of capitalism is very dominant. The 20th century, you find two different ideologies dominating practical economics. On the one hand, a liberal ideology or a Keynesian ideology dominating the capitalist world and a clear socialist ideology dominating the world as controlled by the Soviet Union from 1920 onwards. So, you have a socialist ideology, capitalist ideology and there comes the modern practice of dividing the world into the first world and second world and people who are sort of crawling and stumbling without belonging anywhere were the third world. So, ideology becomes very central to the way knowledge is constructed. And finally, the very process of evolution of knowledge in the name of a science. Look at the word evolution. We already know that evolution is a value loaded, loaded world. We cannot any longer use evolution after studying evolutionary economics. We cannot use the word evolution in, in a very benign fashion. There is a manner in which there seems to be some kind of a selection process going on in what bodies of knowledge come to dominate and what bodies of knowledge fall back into insignificance. In other words, the evolution of knowledge in the name of science, the evolutionary and selective process in the name of science that itself becomes crucial in the understanding of the social construction of knowledge. Now, I can break for a few, so few seconds or a few minutes if you people have some questions on all this or remarks or comments on this. None? Hmm? All right. So, let us look at the third component at the evolution of the very specific knowledge called science. And we say science is a very specific form of knowledge. In order to understand this, the best way is to work through stories and analogies. And the best analogy is for me to try and explain how the idea of the science called economics got constructed in my mind. And it got constructed not at all in what would seem a logical way. It was a series of images which juxtaposed themselves one on top of another, seemed to make sense in some kind of a, an idea of coherence which was not logical in any sense of the word. But later I realized this is the way science is actually constructed, there is no logic to it. So, let us look at this a little bit. You know, when I was about 10 years old, I used to live in a small place called Coimbatore. It is not very important what happened in Coimbatore at that time, because Coimbatore like was like any other small town with schools, one of which I attended. But what was interesting is that in Coimbatore at that time, I presume there still are businesses which were called sound service. These sound services used to have a large number of 45 rpm CDs, no, what is that records? And they used to have these players which played these records and amplifiers and then huge conical microphones. They hired out the services of all these apparatus for innumerable occasions for the noise loving population of Coimbatore. Marriages, weddings, funerals, somebody attains puberty, somebody goes out of puberty, you name it, protest meetings, political meetings, you want noise sound service will give it to you in unimaginably vast decibel quantities. Now, 
a lot of us grew up in that with that as a white noise. It didn't seem to make a difference to us. But what I was curious about was not how they made their business, but I used to at the age of 10 stand looking fascinated at that spinning disc. And I would say, here is this bloody thing spinning, this flat thing and some needle is moving on it and that thing is producing music. It was magic. How come there is something spinning and there is a needle going on it and that thing is booming? Genuine music, it was not roaring and making crackling noises, it was music. I, always, I was always fascinated, so I used to sit and watch. And the place where I used to sit and watch it most was also the place where I used to go and hire bicycles. The place called Antony's Cycle Works, who also operated a sound service, I remember. And this man, Antony, was fascinated by my fascination with this thing. So he asked me, what was I was looking at? He said, I said, oh, Antony, how does it produce all this? So Antony thought he was explaining things further to me, but actually he mystified me even more. He said, you know, this box underneath the record, that's where it's all happening. And you know, in a 10-year-old mind, with zero conception of technology, I said, oh my God, there must be a genie inside. This is this thing going around it and that is a genie sitting inside converting everything into music. And occasionally what would happen is, these records were faulty. So they go repeat themselves. You know, the same line in the song would happen again and again and again. And to me, that was the time when the genie went crazy. You see, it, uh, I say, my God, this bloody thing has gone crazy. It's, it's not working properly. So to me, it was magic. And for a long time, I could not think of a music system or a sound service or uh, all this uh, social events when these things were used in the absence of an idea of an invisible genie which was doing this. I am saying this because some years later, I had to shift to Delhi. My father moved to Delhi and he said, okay, come and join me. So I left my grandparents' house in Coimbatore and went to live in Delhi with my parents. I remember standing in the biting cold winters of Delhi waiting for the school bus, cheeks getting red and going shiver, 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 shiver at 7.30 or 8 in the morning waiting for the bus. And there used to be an acacia tree where we waited for the bus. Dusty, small leaves. And what was in, of interest to us was the fact that under the acacia tree, there was a big hole through which hundreds, if not thousands of black ants were trooping in and out, in and out, in and out. I was fascinated. I said, oh my God. They are all the time moving there, all the time. Where are they going? What are they doing? Now, about one and a half or two feet above these uh, ants which were trooping in and out of the hole on the trunk of the acacia tree were resting some few dozen fat flies. You know, it was cold. It was not warm enough for them to get up and fly. So, they were kind of waiting for the sun to come out and they were sitting there and occasionally a wandering ant would catch sight of these flies and then, my God, the war would start. For in some manner unknown to me, some signal would pass and all the other ants will charge up here and they would try to drag the ant flies down towards the hole. And the flights would take, try, would try to take off with half a dozen ants in tow and this would go on back and forth. I never discovered eventually who won this communal war because always the school bus came and I had to go. But all this stayed in my mind because the genie of the music system, the ants, they all stayed in my mind because the ants puzzled me in the same way as the music system puzzled me. So I said, oh my God, who controls these ants? They are not fighting with each other. They are not, you know, they are working in great unison, dragging the food into their hole. They are not cannibalistically killing each other in the process of getting at the food. There is order, there is discipline, there is some method in it. So I said, there must be something inside the ant, in the ant hill, sorry. Some creature who is a kind of a general or a controller or a king ant, which regulated the whole thing. In my mind, that king ant was something like the genie in the music system. Again, a very complex, well-organized system, 
regulated by some invisible force which was impressive beyond my means to understand. So, this went on. About that time, my family decided that I should join arts group in the school. It was the time I had, I had to make a choice whether I had to go to science or arts. They thought I was fit for arts. They put me in arts group. Strangely, the arts group consisted among other things of higher mathematics, geography, such other non-arts. Economics too. My economics teacher was hard to emphasize is a science, not an art. So, we had economics too. Now, the economics teacher was fascinating because he was probably the best thing I experienced in my life as a teacher of economics. He took great deal of trouble to explain to us very patiently the concepts in economics, the way markets were organized, but my mind wandered. I could not understand, for instance, I can say, I, when somebody says, I want a peanut or I want a roti or I want a, a glass of water or I want a motor bicycle, I could understand that but you could not understand what was meant by wants. You see, I, I could not understand the abstract idea that there were wants. I could always understand that somebody wanted something that I could understand, but wants when as an abstract idea I could not understand. So, I did not know what to do, but that was the way it was. Slowly, my mind started constructing meaning for economic concepts through the images which I had in my mind. I started imagining that wants were like those thousands of ants and the limited means to satisfy the ants were the few dozen flies which were sitting there and uh, the whole activity of the market was the activ concerted activity of the ants at getting at the flies and the invisible hand of the market was nothing other than the general of or the controller of the ants. They would take the food, I always imagine they would take the food inside their big hole in the ground into some cavern and then place the food at the feet of some general or leader and stand like boy scouts in order so that the leader allocated to them, okay, you have so much, you have so much. To me, that was the order of the discipline of the, that was the image of the discipline of the market. So, gradually, when my teacher started talking more economics, when he talked to us about the auctioneer in the Walrasian system, I said, ah, the genie in the record player and the general of the ants and so on. Of course, later economics got constructed in a more complex fashion, but the point I am trying to make is what I was doing was doing what everybody does from the primitive times to modern times. Knowledge is constructed through grooves of images in the mind which are put together to make a meaning. It happens not just with uh, human beings, but also with animals. The world of animals is full of signs and sounds and they all make signs and sounds in order that each of these signs and sounds communicate together meanings. For a long time, I did not understand for instance, that the noise made in serene afternoons in a place full of trees by squirrels or chipmunks in India, you know they go kick, 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 kick and I used to say, oh what a beautiful afternoon noise, so salubrious and so peaceful. It took me ages to realize that that noise made by chipmunks or squirrels was a warning call, it is a danger shout. When they saw a crow or something, then they would go into this noise. It is a warning call, it is completely the opposite of the serenity which I imagined. So, what I am trying to tell you is that animals use sounds and gestures as symbols to communicate meanings. Human beings do the same thing, but human beings use sounds and other symbols which they create through language, through text and so forth to communicate knowledge. So, knowledge is nothing but a series of grooves of thought which put together gives different meanings, that is what I understood. So, science then is a very special kind of set of grooves with a very special kind of construction of meanings. It took me a long time to understand what this was. McCloskey, who is a great critique of orthodox economics, if you ever get a chance, read a book by, the, by McCloskey called The Rhetoric of Economics. It is fascinating where she argues that there is 
as much rhetoric in economics as there is science. She says actually you cannot have economics by only logic, there is so much of rhetoric. She argues for instance that the writings of Samuelson, Becker and others which are so rigid and strict in appearance are full of rhetoric, even mathematics is used rhetorically. So, here is a linguistic element then. McCloskey says economic concepts are like metaphors and they make sense in economics as metaphors do in any language. Slightly earlier than McCloskey about 19, mid 1960s, Nicholas Georgescu Rosen wrote a fascinating book called The Entropy Law and the Economic Process. If you get a chance, do read it, where he says economic concepts are similes, not metaphors, but he says similes. So, Roshan says similes, McCloskey says metaphors, but what is important is for us to understand that these are not logical categories, they are categories in language. And comes a time when I read something written much earlier in 1930s by Max Planck, the great physicist who writes about the philosophy of physics. He says, the whole language of sciences is a separate language consisting of concepts and words which have no real life existence. He for instance talks of energy. Energy has no real life existence, it is only a concept. You cannot look at energy, feel it, grasp it, no, but it is only a concept. So, it has, he lists a whole lot of concepts which have meaning only within the language of science. And so, the language is a complete construct made of such concepts which do not necessarily have a bearing with the real life. But this language is important to science because it does not have the complications of real life which prevent you from understanding causality. Whereas, here you can create a set of concepts which create a, which get a separate meaning and explain causality, scientific causality very clearly. So, Planck calls the world of scientific language as the world image, that is the image of the world captured in scientific language. So, he says it is a different linguistic system. Now, what is of importance here is to understand then that science is far different from the way I understood it in my school days. When I thought of science in my school days, I was thinking of Faraday and uh, Einstein, what is that? Who is the person who invented light? Edison and so on and so forth, working in laboratories, working making experiments and dedicated to truth and so on and so forth. I am sure there were all these things. But what I did not understand was that they were all working in the framework of a new language, a different language. More importantly, the word science attached itself in my heart and mind as a moral category which it took me many decades to recover from. Because I was convinced that all the bright kids in the school were in the science group. So, I thought all science was brilliant, all non-science was not brilliant. So, to me anybody who was worthwhile anything in society had to be scientist. Anybody who was not worthwhile was not a scientist. So, there was all kinds of confusion, but it is only after I understood Planck that these confusions were went out of my mind that science is just another language consisting of a scientific world image. Now, what is the scientific world image all about? It is a world of concepts which are tightly interlinked to make logical coherence in a very rigid sense. And it was organized or it is organized in this fashion because strict logical coherence is the best way in which you can explain causality. To say that x causes y, you have to be very certain that only x causes only y not a th hundred, other, hundred other things behind x who might be causing a dozen other things beyond y. So, that to say that x causes y involves a considerable, considerable amount of logical coherence and clarity. And the world of science 
scientific world image is just a language which is created to acquire and to demonstrate this power of logical coherence. So, that causality in the scientific sense must be might be very clearly established, which means that economics has its own world image too. What is utility in economics? Can you grasp it with your hands? Can you measure it in a jar? Can you see how long it is with an inch tape? What can you do with the utility? Okay. What about the idea of productivity in economics? Do we see what productivity is? When we say marginal product of labor, is that something which you can attribute to labor? Although we say each additional laborer results in some product and the product created by the last laborer just now used by the firm is marginal product etcetera that is language of the science, but can you grasp it? Can you grasp any of the laws of economics? Law of diminishing returns, is not it purely another fiction like the law of entropy in physics. So, you look at economics you will find that the idea of rent in economics rent is not what you pay your landlord for a monthly use of space in economics rent is something else. It is a purely derived category it is some kind of surplus derived out of calculation of some other things. So, what I am trying to show you here is that economics is full of concepts which are linked through logical coherence. So, orthodox economic theory is nothing but a scientific world image. So, the first thing we understand now is that in the construction of science and specifically in the construction of economic science, there is involved a process of construction of a language. Is this something stable, static, something which is given forever or is there a dynamic in this? Is there something which induces transformations in this? Is there some things induce which, which induce change in this? Some things which induce some kind of movement in this whole structure of language and its creation and its making in the society? Certainly, there is and that is the whole logic of research, that is the whole logic of scientific revolution, but we will postpone that for a few minutes and do that after the break. <laughs>